I wanted to show you some examples of my solutions to the work energy bar charts um, since I'm not going to be available for our Google Meet on Thursday. So I'll upload the solutions along with this. Um, well, I'll upload this, I guess, as well. And then uh, hopefully this will be as a reasonable facsimile of what we would do during the Google Meet. So for part one, these things were non quantitative, meaning we're looking at numbers of bars, but not the exact amount. The key thing, as you hopefully know by now, is we got to decide whether there is or isn't friction. I should reword this as just friction or not, instead of frictionless, but that's okay. And we also need to think about our system. So in this case, I chose my system as being the earth, the cart, and the spring. Initially, when the cart is up here, it's got all elastic potential energy. It doesn't matter exactly how many bars, just pick a number. At the tippy top of its path, it's still moving, so at this final condition, it still has some kinetic energy, but it also has gravitational potential energy, and the spring energy is gone. It's pushed into the car. So I had some kinetic energy at the top and a lot of gravitational energy. That made sense to me. No internal energy because I said that it was frictionless, meaning no friction, no internal energy as heat. In this case, for number two, I switched, uh, I switched this up, and I had two possible systems. In purple, I have the same system as I had initially, the earth, cart, and the spring. Or in red, I have only the earth or the cart. Either way, initially, or pardon me, initially, if the spring is in the system, it's the same as in number one. If the spring is not as in the system, and then I've got zero elastic energy here. The end situation, since I'm not as high up, I have a little more kinetic energy and less gravitational potential energy. So I have two and a half bars and one and a half bars. But if the spring is not in my system, where did those come from? Well, they came from the spring, so I have an arrow coming in and four bars. Rather than trying to draw that on Kami, I hope what you would end up doing would just be saying four bars. Okay. For number three, I chose both frictionless and not frictionless. So frictionless, I said yes, so we'll assume there's no friction there. It's a moving, so it's velocity's above zero, but it's at position zero here. Here it's not moving, but it's above zero position. So we have kinetic energy here. That's fantastic. And at the end, when if I have no friction, all that kinetic energy has gone into gravitational energy. If there is friction, and I have earth car and then the surface as my system, then some of that gravitational energy is going to go into internal energy because I think it's going to stay in the earth or the car or the surface. And so I'd have less gravitational energy and that just means that the car wouldn't go as high. So number four, a person pushes a car with the parking brake on. So this is not frictionless. There is friction in this case. That's pretty obvious because the parking brake is on. So I made my system the surface, the car, and the earth. I didn't have the person in my system because I wouldn't know how to account for that energy that they've got. Um, in this particular case then, zero kinetic, zero gravitational, zero elastic at the beginning. I'm getting energy from the person who's pushing or doing work on the car. And at the end, we're uphill and there's some heat. It's not moving in either case at the beginning or the end. It did move in between those two, but it's not moving at the beginning or the end. Number five, oh, and if you did choose the person in the system, I'm not sure how you'd account for this. Maybe elastic, like the muscles are kind of like springs? I don't know. Um, number five, a load of bricks on a tightly coiled spring and then is launched into the air. So I said this was frictionless. It doesn't matter whether you would choose that or not. You would have a slight change over here. So my system was bricks and earth. I did not have the spring in the system. So I had zero, 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 some bars from the spring, and since it's moving here still, as it's moving upward, I had some gravitational and some potential energy. The exact split of this doesn't matter, as long as the total number of bars equals the total number of bars coming in from the spring. And again, if the spring is included in the system, then however many total bars you have would be over here as elastic.
So this is very similar to a problem like this. Six uh, crate is propelled up a hill by a tightly coiled spring. Again, it's moving still here at the end. So very similar to number five. Notice it looks the same. The specific values don't matter. I said it was frictionless, so no friction. If it isn't, again, the spring could either be part or not part of the system. If there's friction, you could have it included here if you include the crate earth spring system. Or maybe the surface as well, I guess I would say. Um, you probably would need the surface if this internal energy stays in. If you didn't include the surface, some of that heat energy would leave. And you'd show that in your energy flow diagram. For part two, I would recommend using G as 10 meters per second squared or newtons per kilogram. So in this case, we've got the cart moving. I said, um, in this case, the system was car, earth, spring. I did not assume that there was any friction. So we have initially kinetic energy, and at the end it's elastic energy. So kind of the reverse of some of these. So, so all kinetic, all elastic over here. So I said initial equals final, kinetic energy equals elastic potential energy, 1 half mv squared equals 1 half k delta x squared. So those are our formulas. 1 half 8 times 5 squared, 1 half 50 delta x squared. And k is that spring constant. So that was compressed 2 meters. Here it says determine the final velocity of the cart, assuming 10% of the energy is dissipated by friction. So we have gravitational potential energy up here, kinetic energy here, and probably some friction or heat internal energy down here. So I put four bars. Here I had you know, a little over three and a half bars. Here I had about a little less than a half bar. So what I did is I figured out first, initially PE grav, at the end KE, and then the work done by friction. So initially that's 20 times 10 times 5, that's MGH. It's not really the color I wanted. Oh well. Put that down there. Um, so that's a thousand joules. Well, if 10% of it's lost, I'm taking off 10% before I go and figure out the kinetic energy. So 10% of 1,000 is 100, so I'm left with 900 joules, 1,000 minus 100. So then I use the 900 equals 1 half mv squared, and that gives me around 9.5 meters per second. You don't want to say 1,000 equals 1 half mv squared, get a speed, and then take off 10%. If you do that, you'll get the wrong answer because you'll end up getting, if you use 1,000 equals 1 half mv squared, you'll get a velocity of 10, and then you would take off 10% go to 9. But if you plug it back in, 1 half 20 times 9 squared, it gives me 810 joules, which is about a 19% loss of energy. And this said 10% loss of energy. So just be careful about that. This is a block is compressed 0.3 meters. What height does it reach? So this is, again, similar to one in the first part. Here it's not moving. Here it's compressed on a spring. We're assuming it's at zero to begin with. So elastic potential energy at the beginning equals gravitational at the end. 1 half kx squared equals mgh. I get an h of 0.9 meters. All here, all here, no friction, and that's my system. This one's a little harder for number four. So the bullet strikes a block of wood and enter, which exerts on average a force of 50,000 newtons. So you could have this as being bullet block earth all in the system, or you could have had the bullet outside the system transferring energy in. doesn't particularly matter. The bullet's moving here, so it's a lot of kinetic energy. It's not moving. No gravitational. If you said it was zero at the beginning, if you said there was like a one bar of gravitation at the beginning, it would be the same amount at the end. So it really doesn't factor into the equations. And we're not thinking of this as a spring. So that all goes internally. 
and to heat things up. So essentially, the initial energy is kinetic energy. The final energy is the work done, the force times distance done on the block. So I get one half m, got to convert this to kilograms, that's 0 0.025 kilograms, velocity squared, equals 50,000 newtons times distance. And that comes out to about 3 centimeters, which is 0 0.03 meters. And by the way, eh, not this one yet. <laughs> yeah, this one here, sorry about this. This mass, 500 grams, that's got to be converted to kilograms because that's the standard unit of mass, 0.5 kilograms down here. Otherwise, you would end up getting way tinier, like 0 0.00090 meters. That's for your height. This one's the hardest problem. I think A and B are reasonable to do. C is really tough. D makes sense if you got C. So I'm going to skip to number six. Two kilogram balls attached to a ceiling by a one centimeter long string. Height of the room is three meters. What's the gravitational potential mg relative to these three spaces? So we normally think of the floor, and we'd say mgh. Well, it's two meters above the floor, so that's plus 40 joules. If we think of point at the same elevation of the ball, there's no delta H or no difference in height. So that would be zero joules of potential energy relative to the same height. And if we think about the ceiling, which is kind of weird, the ball is a meter below the ceiling. And so we actually would have MGH with H being negative 1. We'd have negative potential energy. So negative 20 joules. That's why I would recommend always choosing an easy place for your zero potential energy because it'll make more sense to you there. So let's go back to number five. A 200 kilogram box pulled at a constant speed by a little engine. This, since the box travels is 2.5 meters, this says there's a coefficient of friction that's 0.20. Draw a force diagram for the relevant forces acting on the box. The normal forces and the gravitational force, which are up and down, not relevant to the motion of the box. If you want to draw them, that's fine. If it says it's being pulled at a constant speed, it does say here, if it's being pulled at a constant speed, that means these forces are balanced. So friction is equal to tension. So what I've got here is I've got some kinetic energy at the beginning, some kinetic energy at the end. The engine is doing work, and there is some internal energy at the end. So we're adding to that. It's coming from the engine. Um, So I should draw that. And we have something like, I'm doing a cast, yeah. And we have something like this, where um, we'd have two, we'd have some couple bars like that. I don't know why I drew the third one up there. So two and one down here. Um, so we end up, when it's asking about how much energy is transferred to the, by the engine, we need to think about the force and the distance. So this is going to be work that's done. So the force of friction is the coefficient of friction times a normal force. That was from way early in the year. 0.2 times 2,000 newtons. And how do I get 2,000 newtons? Well, m times g, 200 kilograms times 10 newtons per kilogram times 0.2. It's 400 newtons of force. Multiplied by that distance, it's a thousand joules. So that's how much energy is transferred to the engine. What kind of motion would occur if the engine pulled with 500 newtons? Well, if there's 400 newtons of friction, which is equal to 400 newtons of tension here initially, now if this goes to 500 newtons, we would actually have an acceleration to the right. I did not ask you to quantify that. So again, hopefully, this is something uh, th these answers kind of make sense other than maybe this one for part C and D because I think that's pretty challenging. So I will post these and thanks for paying attention.